Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Antibiotics have been used for more than 70 years to treat patients who have infectious diseases. And talk about success. Since the 1940s, antibiotics have saved countless lives and cured, well, literally millions of infections. But antibiotics have been used so widely and for so long that now the organisms the antibiotics are designed to kill, well, they've adapted. Oh, you know, these bugs are actually pretty so smart. They're so tricky. And that has made the drugs, unfortunately, less effective. Mm -hmm. And there are some bacteria that are resistant to almost all of the high-powered antibiotics we've got. That's troubling. Yeah. yeah. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, each year in the U.S., at least 2 million people become infected with bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. And at least 23,000 people die each year as a direct result of those infections. Here to discuss antibiotic resistance is Mayo Clinic Infectious Disease Specialist, Dr. Napuni Rajapaksi. Welcome back to the program. It's great to see you. Thanks. It's great to be back. Yeah, it's good to have you on the program. Let me let me try that. Napuni Rajapaksi. You got it. Great. <laughs> great to have you on the program. So we've got a problem, don't we? Uh, resistant bugs that our antibiotics are having difficulty treating. Yeah, you know, we're starting to see this more and more now, and it's becoming more and more common, and it's going to continue to become a bigger and bigger issue as we go along here. Um, we're seeing this affecting people across the lifespan from kids to the elderly and we think we have a reasonably good handle of what is causing this so the real issue now is putting measures into place to see what we can do to slow down the process. Not a lot makes me really nervous when we do these radio interviews <laughs> but this this one does because I always feel like we're it's a movie it's a script waiting waiting to write itself I mean but really, it, we, it just kind of goes through the years. We figure out a way to stop, and then it changes its whole path. Is that the way that it works? Yeah, you know, we've been uh, pretty lucky so far in being able to uh, develop new antibiotics and new ways to outsmart these bacteria. But they're, they're really smart, and they're uh, changing at a pace that it's really difficult for us to keep up with to develop new drugs. So we're seeing fewer and fewer new antibiotics being developed. And so we're having to come up with strategies to preserve the use of the antibiotics that we have in our toolkit right now. You, you said that you, you were pretty certain that you had a handle on what the causes uh, were. What, so what are they? Yes, yeah, so it's a very complicated issue, but uh, we do know that the biggest driver of uh, the development of resistance in bacteria, as well as other types of microorganisms, is the overuse of antibiotics. And so we know that antibiotics are amongst the most frequently prescribed medications to humans, also to animals in the agricultural industry as well. And so that's been kind of identified as the top reason for the issues that we're running into now. Not overprescription for humans, but overuse in the agricultural? So both. So both okay, overprescription to humans as okay. well as uh, use in the agricultural industry. Um, we know that when you expose bacteria to antibiotics, part of their evolutionary strategy is to survive. And so they can develop mutations that uh, allow them to resist those antibiotics or develop resistance. And so as you have that process happening over time and in uh, many different people and many different animals across the world, um, you start to see that uh, bacteria that used to be quite sensitive to the antibiotics that we have are now mm -hmm. developing resistance. How much, you know, I, I, maybe I'm on, I get sick and, and I'm on an antibiotic for seven to 10 days, but I'm eating food every day. And if I'm eating food that has antibiotics in it every day, is that a bigger deal? Or so, is it that it's such a small amount that it's a less important deal? So both issues are uh, important. I don't think we truly know how much each contributes mm. to the overlying issue because it's so complex and you have this occurring uh, across the world. Um, but we do know that we need to tackle this problem in multiple different ways. So that means uh, things targeted towards prescription of antibiotics and humans taking antibiotics, but also um, strategies in the veterinary and agricultural industry to uh, decrease the use and potentially eliminate the use of uh, antibiotics in those groups. Why do you think it is that antibiotics historically have been so overprescribed? So that's a, it's a good question, and it's very complicated. There are a lot of people doing research into figure out why is it that we've uh, gotten to this situation now. Um, there are a lot of different factors that go into a decision to prescribe antibiotics for a patient. We sit across from patients each day and have complex uh, discussions about patient symptoms and conditions and try and come to a consensus as to what the best path forward is for them. Um, but uh, sometimes there are uh, other factors outside of what is recommended in guidelines or the symptoms that the patient has that plays a role in deciding to prescribe. 
Um, we do know that it can be very difficult sometimes in an emergency department or in a clinic setting to distinguish the patient that has a viral infection from a bacterial infection. Uh, we have some tests that can help us with that as well, but it can be challenging and um, often there's kind of a mentality both from parents and fr from patients and from physicians as well that sometimes the safe thing to do for a certain condition is to prescribe an antibiotic even though the most likely cause is viral. And as we know, uh, antibiotics really have no effect at all against viruses. And so in those situations, we know that um, the risks of taking an antibiotic outweigh any sort of benefit that the patient has, um, both in terms of uh, side effects, but also for this greater issue of resistance in the population. And it makes the mother or the patient think you're doing something. <laughs> yeah. Don't you think that's a big part of it? I oh, think huge. for sure. Um, it's it's a difficult to sit there and say, you have a viral infection, there's nothing I can give you really mm -hmm. to help you to uh, kill off that virus, aside from your immune system kicking in to help you to feel better. But there are other things that physicians can uh, recommend, uh, what we call symptomatic treatment. So whether that's uh, it's not the same. Acetaminophen nope. or well, ibuprofen for an ear infection. Sure. Things is like it that. then, is it just people are imagining that they feel better if they get this, uh, is it the placebo effect? They have a virus, but you, the mom says my kid really needs an antibiotic. Does the antibiotic not help the child feel better at all? We just think that it does? So if you have a virus, an antibiotic will not help you get better. It has no activity against a virus. But we know the natural history of viral infections is usually you'll feel pretty bad for anywhere from three days to a week and then start to feel better on your own. Usually that's around the time that you start an antibiotic. So it's probably just the viral infection getting better on its own. So why did they ever think that we should give out antibiotics? For, did they just think, oh, there's probably not a big harm? to hand out. It makes people feel like they're feeling better. Uh, so that's why that was ever started in the first place. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of it, uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's very co complicated, but uh, part of it is this just in case, just in case there may be an early bacterial infection or something like that. Um, physicians are uh, seeming to prescribe antibiotics to this group. Can a viral infection tr become a bacterial infection if you don't get better, if you don't take care of it? So a small proportion of people with a viral respiratory tract infection can go on to develop what we call a bacterial super infection after that. Um, so that can be things like a pneumonia or sinus infection or ear infection. However, treating them when they just have signs of the viral infection with an antibiotic does nothing to prevent or uh, decrease their chance of going on to develop that type of infection. So give us some examples of typical viral illnesses that in general should not be treated with antibiotics. Now, uh, you know, it's not clear cut, but um, uh, to give us some examples of, uh, like mono, for I, w I was thinking of. Sure, yeah, so for sure, uh, things like mono, so that usually presents with uh, fever, uh, fatigue, enlarged lymph nodes, sometimes sore throat. Um, there's no benefit to receiving uh, an antibiotic for that. It does nothing for uh, the viruses that, that cause mono. Uh, the common cold, so uh, upper respiratory tract symptoms like uh, runny nose, cough, um, that, again, is a viral syndrome, and so antibiotics will be of no benefit. Um, many, many uh, sore throats, so probably 95% of sore throats are viral in origin and not related to strep, which is the most common bacterial cause of sore throat. And so uh, sore throat, especially if it's associated with a runny nose or a cough um, or a viral type rash, really shouldn't be treated uh, with antibiotics. And if someone does think that strep is a possibility, they should always get a throat swab first to confirm that the strep bacteria is there before. And describing. not give the antibiotic unless it's positive. Yes, that is correct. Ear infections in kids always used to get antibiotics. Yeah, so many um, ear infections uh, are associated with uh, viral syndromes. It's really important if a physician is uh, diagnosing a true uh, otitis media or um, ear infection. We, the current recommendations from the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics are that uh, for a vast majority of kids, what we call watchful waiting is uh, appropriate. So that means you can wait uh, a couple of days to see if the child gets better on their own and then initiate an antibiotic at that point, if not. What we need is a good antiviral drug. <laughs> yes. And then we've got for, something to give them other than an antibiotic, right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that is true. All right, we've been talking about antibiotic resistance with infectious disease specialist Dr. Napuni Rajapaksi. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll dive into another topic, but not unrelated, antibiotic allergies, including this myth or matter of fact. Uh, nine out of ten people who think they have a penicillin allergy really don't. We'll find out. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. 
Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our guest is Napuni Rajapaksi, Dr. Napuni Rajapaksi. You just love to say it, don't you? <laughs> I'm telling you, yes. <laughs> she is an infectious disease specialist. We've been talking about antibiotic resistance and all the bugs that have now started to outsmart the antibiotics. But time to switch gears. We're going to talk about uh, allergies to antibiotics, and we're going to start out with that myth or matter of fact. Interesting. Yeah, myth or matter of fact, Dr. Napuni Rajapaksi. <laughs> Nine out of 10 people who think they have a penicillin allergy really don't. Is that a myth or is that a fact? That is a fact. So studies have shown that a vast majority of patients who think they're allergic to penicillin, the most commonly reported uh, type of antibiotic allergy, actually are not. Well, someone must have told them along the way that they were, or did they How did they just get that say, wrong? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's a, a few different scenarios that we commonly run into uh, when it comes to antibiotic allergies. Um, one common scenario is that the person had some sort of event when taking an antibiotic, usually as a young child, um, so they can't recall the event themselves, but they were told by their parent or their parent was told by their physician that they were allergic to this antibiotic and they shouldn't take it again. Um, and the second uh, kind of common scenario is that uh, Symptoms which are not uh, related to an allergy, so common things like uh, abdominal pain, uh, nausea, or diarrhea uh, that people commonly have while taking an antibiotic are thought to be a sign of an allergy, and so they report being allergic to those medications. So that's what's happening that makes people think that they have an allergy. Yeah. It's just some sort of reaction, and then they say, oh, penicillin it. Al allergy. Exactly. So huh. it's important to distinguish between having an allergy to something and having a side effect from a medication. So uh, commonly in patients that we prescribe antibiotics for, um, we do see it, they can cause uh, some uh, stomach upset, some cramping, diarrhea, or non-hives type rashes. So what does a true penicillin allergy look like? So the things that we always uh, ask our patients to uh, look out for, there's a spectrum of uh, symptoms that can present as allergy. Um, the most severe type of allergy that we all uh, worry about and hear about is something called anaphylaxis. That usually presents um, in a few different ways, but the common symptoms being uh, hives uh, type itchy rash, um, uh, breathing difficulties, swelling of the airway, um, or dangerously low blood pressure. That does that happen when you take the first dose? So um, it, uh, it's a bit complicated. It's pretty unusual for it to happen with the first dose okay. just because uh, usually you have to be sensitized to the uh, antibiotic okay. before, but um, that doesn't go for, for all scenarios necessarily. Um, and then, as I said, there's kind of a spectrum. So even uh, just a hives-type rash developing after exposure to an antibiotic could be a sign that you may be um, developing a more severe uh, allergic-type reaction if you go on to be exposed to that. Is there a way you can tell for sure if you're allergic to a particular antibiotic without taking the antibiotic? So that's a great question. Um, there is skin testing that can be done, usually by allergy specialists, uh, to see if you're allergic to a penicillin. Um, so what we would encourage for uh, patients who think that they may be allergic and are not quite sure is to talk to their uh, primary physician, uh, discuss what their symptoms were, and if they feel it's warranted, they may be a candidate to have allergy skin testing done. But 9 out of 10, that's a lot of people that think that they're allergic to penicillin. Is that, does that mean that more people are becoming, they're figuring this out? Oh, wait, a real, does that mean that really I don't have this and now I can use it? Is it penicillin is becoming more widely used now? Uh, well, it seems like nobody uses penicillin anymore. So if 9 out of 10 think they're <laughs> allergic to it, that's why. <laughs> so uh, the antibiotic penicillin itself, so there's an antibiotic called penicillin. There's a family of antibiotics called penicillin. Oh. Um, and so that family of antibiotics is very commonly used. And so generally, if you report an allergy to um, one uh, antibiotic within that family, people will not prescribe you something else within the entire family. And uh, these are antibiotics that are usually the first line or first choice antibiotics for treatment of many common infections. And so the reason why it's so important to uh, really sort out this issue is that when we start going to what we call second or third line or th choice antibiotics for uh, management of these infections, they're often not as effective as the first choice. They're often more toxic than the first choice, and they're often more expensive than the first choice antibiotics. And so we really don't want to be giving those antibiotics to patients unless we truly believe that they are allergic to the first choice ones. If you think uh, that the story about uh, allergy or, uh, to penicillin is suspect, do you recommend that they get skin tested? 
Yeah, so it uh, depends a bit on the specific patient scenario, especially if they're a type of patient with an underlying medical condition where I would uh, predict that they'll probably need to be treated for infections multiple times in their future. Those patients, for sure, we always like to do what we can to sort out whether they truly are um, allergic or not. Um, other patients, depending on the story of what happened when they took the antibiotic, this, we may be able to just tell from the story itself that this was not an allergy and counsel them for that. The ones that fall in the gray area are a bit, bit more difficult to tease out. As a consumer or as a mother, what do you recommend that, that we do or that lay people do that might help with the antibiotic resistance uh, issue? So I think um, the best thing that uh, people can do is firstly to uh, try and do what they can to prevent themselves from getting sick. Getting sick can lead to getting prescribed an antibiotic and that's really what we want to stop. So the things that we recommend for prevention of uh, infection really is good hand washing and keeping your immunizations uh, up to date. Um, of course, you can do all of that and still fall ill. Um, the best thing that we recommend in that uh, scenario is for uh, if you go in to see your doctor, you can discuss what the symptoms are and make an informed decision along with your doctor as to the best uh, type of treatment for you. So if your doctor thinks that you truly do have a bacterial infection and prescribes you an antibiotic, it's fine to go ahead and take that uh, antibiotic. But it's also important if your doctor thinks that you have a viral illness, uh, not to ever pressure them to prescribe an antibiotic if it's not not going to be of benefit to you. Is there another, uh, besides a penicillin allergy, are there other antibiotic allergies that people suffer from that are common? Um, so the next most common after penicillin is usually a sulfa allergy. Um, so that might be an allergy to a common antibiotic called Bactrim or uh, related uh, medications. Now we have uh, antiviral drugs for, as best I can recall, herpes zoster and for the flu. If you start to take it when you first have your symptoms, why don't we have antiviral drugs for other viral illnesses like the common cold? And will we have soon? Yeah, it was a, it's a good question. Um, a lot of these viruses uh, change very much year to year. They circulate very commonly and can have uh, changes that mean that a uh, single antiviral medication is unlikely to uh, be able to keep up with all of those changes and be effective. Um, and so we don't uh, have co uh, antivirals for common cold or anything like that. But soon we will, and that will help in the overprescribing of antibiotics, right? It may. We'll have to see. I hope so. We've been talking about antibiotics with Mayo Clinic Infectious Disease Specialist Dr. Napuni Rajapaksi. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.